Hey friends, welcome back to today's episode of Everyday Truths. I am sitting in the airport at Ben Gurion Airport in Israel, Tel Aviv. It is um, it's morning time here on Monday, so it's the middle of the night on Sunday for, or Monday morning for many of you. But looking forward to getting this episode completed so that we're, there's something to listen to on Tuesday. Uh, we have been working our way through Romans chapter 10, which I have found so ironic with the fact that we're in Israel. Uh, Paul had this great burden for his own people. And we talked to last episode about, to me, the, the heart of the gospel, that we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, that Jesus is Lord. We believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead and we're saved. I mean, what simplicity, what elegance, what power, uh, what grace. And I just love talking about it. So did Paul. But remember, the, the larger context of Romans 9, 10, and 11 is his heart for his own people. And if the gospel really is that simple in the sense of assimilating it by faith, if we don't have to go about establishing our own righteousness, but we indeed can receive the gift righteousness of Messiah, of Jesus, then why is Israel so lost? Uh, why have they been, it, does this almost sounds like a new concept. It sounds as if uh, perhaps uh, Israel just didn't, uh, was never told this. And, and that's not the case because watch what the Apostle Paul says. Let's pick it up in verse 13, which is a, which is a quotation from Joel 2, kind of hearkening back to Peter's message at Pentecost. But look at Romans 10, 13 again. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The name of God means that for which God is known, his power, his, his grace, his, um, uh, his righteousness. Um, and here, Paul quotes from Joel, and clearly uh, it's a salvation gospel message. So what, what's the hang up? Well, look at verse number 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? So a couple things there. First of all, calling upon the Lord is more than a rote prayer. It's more than simply saying words or repeating words that somebody else gives you to say. It's more than just the verbalization of a right creed. No, watch what the Bible says in verse 14. We call upon him whom we believe. So yesterday we made the, the point that salvation is a heart condition belief, that we put our faith and trust in Jesus. And then we call, we call. The calling upon Jesus is an evidence of a faith that's invested in him. So how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe on him of whom they have not heard? So belief must have an object, right? So we can't believe something unless we know what we're believing. So we believe on him, we believe on him of whom we have heard. So we believe on who Jesus is, what Jesus did, what God did on his behalf in raising him from the dead. Uh, we've talked about all of this. So how then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? How shall they believe on him of whom they've not heard, heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So God in his plan, in his economy has chosen that people tell people. That's always been the case. It's been the case throughout the Bible that God uses the agency of other human beings to get the gospel to other human beings. And I think that's the larger context of the purpose of Israel, is that God wasn't like just saying, Abraham, I wanna save you and your kids. No, that, that's not the Abrahamic covenant. God was saying, Abraham, I'm choosing you for special and select service so that through you, I reach the world. God uses people to bless people. He uses people to help people. So how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? So Paul, I think, is thinking of himself here and the fact that he was commissioned by Christ to get the gospel message to the ends of the world. 
I think he's thinking about that great prophetic and apostolic tradition that God uses people. I've got this guy here that's uh, cleaning up and he's pushing chairs around very noisily. Um, but hey, he's doing his job. So um, h- how should they hear without a preacher? How should they preach except they be sent? And when I think about except they be sent, I think about the greatest verse in all the Bible, in my opinion, which is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that he sent his son into this world uh, to save us. So the sending really is a matter of what God does. And God sent his son for everybody. And I want you to just to take a moment right now and think about the people whom God sent to you in your experience. The, maybe some godly parents, maybe a faithful coworker, Maybe a Sunday school teacher or a vacation Bible school worker. But who is it that God has used in your life to bring you the gospel? Why? Because that's how God works. I think about how God sent Philip from that thriving meeting in Samaria down to speak to that Ethiopian eunuch in the desert. And that's where we were, in that desert. And God sent somebody to to us. Look at verse number... Uh, 15, again, so how shall they preach except they be sent? And then Paul quotes, I I love this, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace, that bring glad tidings of good things. That's a quotation from Isaiah. A lot of times when you think about the book of Isaiah, you think about it as the Bible in miniature. It says the Bible has 66 books, so Isaiah has 66 chapters, the Bible's divided Old Testament, New Testament, uh, 39, ch- cha- 39 books, 27 books. So Isaiah, 39 chapters, 27 chapters. I mean, it's very, very similar. And Isaiah's ministry, what his prophetic ministry, he spoke much about Messiah. In chapter 52, the coming suffering servant, because Isaiah 53 is that passage that talks about the suffering servant, what Jesus did on the cross. It was the passage that uh, Philip used with the Ethiopian eunuch. But in, fi- in Isaiah 52, wow, well, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So all the way back in the Old Testament, Isaiah was telling that generation about the gospel and about the, the necessity of receiving the good news. That's what gospel means, good news. And how beautiful are the feet of them Now, why? Why would it say that? Because metaphorically, the gospel is that which ought to be taken to others. That's why the emphasis here is on sent. If I send you, then you have to move. So feet would connote movement, motion, going, proactivity. And the Bible says it's beautiful when we, at the behest of God, take that gospel and go with that gospel not wait for people to come and ask us about it, but go. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Hey, you know what a good thing is? The fact that Jesus died for you. The fact that Jesus was buried and rose again. Hey, that's glad tidings of good things. It's the gospel, the Bible says, of peace. And that's what we're all looking for, right? Peace, peace in our heart. Peace with God, because in our sinfulness, in our humanity, there is no peace with God. We're at enmity with Him. We don't measure up. But what did Jesus do? He brought peace through the cross. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Not just a truce, not just a a ceasefire, but we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Wow, that's good news. Let's uh, go on to one more verse where it says in verse number 16, for they have, but, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. So Paul is kind of answering the way maybe some of his, his readers would respond. Yeah, but, but wait a minute, if it's that easy and, and Israel did get the gospel and, and Israel had, did have the prophets and, and they did hear the message, uh, but they have not all believed, exactly. It's not an inevitable belief. It's not some kind of a Calvinistic, deterministic belief. No, it's an option. Just like 
Moses gave them that option to choose in Deuteronomy chapter 30. So Isaiah is saying, even with right information, even with the gospel preached, even with this great message, some are not going to believe. It's their choice, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? But even, uh, even Isaiah was incredulous that the message that God vested him with was not believed by his generation. And indeed, there were 10 out of the 12 tribes in North, uh, the northern Israel that didn't believe any of it. They were wiped out by the Assyrians. And even in Judah, uh, there were those that, that didn't believe. Some did. And that's the case today. Some believe, some don't believe. Our job is not to make people believe. Our job is to go, beautiful feet, to go with the gospel and give people that message of salvation. Glad tidings of good things, as good news, as cold waters to a thirsty soul. So as good news from a far country. I love that verse. So verse number uh, 16 again, they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? Uh, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. See that? So faith is not this, well, just have faith. That doesn't mean anything. Faith detached from its object is not faith. That's just a, a wish. No, faith is foundation. It's substantive. It, it finds, it finds uh, a root somewhere. So faith comes by hearing. You know, people can't put faith in something until they hear about it, until they know about it, and hearing by the word of God. So where is our faith? It's firmly planted in the promises of the word of God and the God of that word. So I hope that word helps you today. Appreciate you joining me in the Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv, Israel. By the way, totally, totally safe traveling to Israel. We had a great week, enjoyed ourselves, looking forward to coming back in the near future. I would love to take you with me. Until then, God bless you, my friends.